Today, amongst other things, I'll explain to you what the four essential elements are that make the SpaceX Starship program possible. What about it? Go for launch. Or go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It? And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates Hello Y family, we're almost there. It feels a bit like Christmas every time another hub is imminent. All the work done by the SpaceX crew culminating in one big new milestone. But is it going to work out? Is SpaceX going to have success in the end? Is it even possible? That's what we're going to try to find out today. To build Starships and especially later on to mass produce them, SpaceX needs lots of infrastructure. Hundreds of Starships will need to be mass produced if Musk's plan of a self-sustaining Mars colony is to succeed. These are not the only components needed though. SpaceX no doubt is following a solid plan. In a recent tweet, Elon Musk captured it in a nutshell again. Four essential elements are needed. Rapid and complete rocket reuse, low-cost propellant, orbital refilling and propellant production at the destination. Element number one would be SpaceX's Starship. Developed in Boca Chica at SpaceX's South Texas launch site, it's arguably the biggest innovation in spaceflight history since the German V2 rocket. Because basically, since then, not much has changed up until SpaceX entered the stage. Rockets became more complex, more powerful. Vehicles like the Space Shuttle were able to take crew and payload in one flight. The Saturn V even got us to the moon. But all of them had one thing in common. They were not completely reusable. And even if they were partly reusable, like the Space Shuttle, it took a large amount of money and time to get them ready for another flight. The record was set by Shuttle Atlantis, which can now be found at an exhibition at the Kennedy Space Center. In between October 3rd and November 27th in 1985, it took them only 55 days between two flights to get it ready for the next mission. All that came with one big disadvantage though. Taking all design, development and maintenance costs into account, the final cost of the Space Shuttle program, averaged over all missions and adjusted for inflation, was estimated to come out to 1.5 billion per launch, or 60,000 per kilogram to LEO. SpaceX wants to reduce this metric down to basically nothing compared to the Space Shuttle. They want to be able to reuse a Starship with a turnaround of less than a day and marginal refurbishment. And they are actively working on it right now. What you're looking at here is everyday astronaut Tim Dodd's absolutely awesome slow motion video of the final static fire before launch. Everything worked perfectly, no hiccups. Test dates are set for November 30th, December 1st and December 2nd. We're finally there. Starship serial number 8 will be the first prototype to reach a significant height. I'll of course provide a live stream so we can watch this historic moment together. Since there is no equivalent to a 45th weather squadron at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station that would provide us with launch weather forecasts for Boca Chica, Texas, let's try to at least get a good idea if the weather would be a problem. On Monday, we have winds of up to 20 knots with gusts to 30 knots and cloud coverage above the sea. Not very good. On Tuesday though, winds are calming down to 3 to 9 knots with gusts around 12 and the clouds off the coast should not pose a problem either. So the flight might not happen on Monday and Tuesday looks to be the best day right now. Of course, we're still a few days out and so the forecast might still change. I'll keep you updated on Twitter, make sure to follow me there. To be able to reach the goal, one prototype is not enough though. SpaceX needs dozens of prototypes to complete the iterative design. Taking a look into SpaceX's high bay at the construction site through Mary's camera reveals another milestone. This is a change of philosophy by the way. On Starship Serial Number 8, the stacking of nose cone and tank section happened at the launch site. So even if Starship Serial Number 8 craters or has a rapid unscheduled disassembly, SpaceX can just go on to the next prototype and take the collected data from the anomaly to improve future prototypes even further now that Serial Number 9 is done. And even Starship Serial Number 9 already has many improvements over Number 8. Wiring is more robust, engines are more mature, the nose cone is sealed better and so on. Major updates can be expected for Starship Serial Number 15, by the way. Musk did not specify though what those would be. The landing pad in the middle of the launch site is cleared by now and only needs a good cleaning before the flight can take place. We're all set for launch. 
The Y team needs your support. Give the video a like, subscribe and share it to show the YouTube algorithm that you appreciate the content. Want to give a more direct support? Consider becoming a patron or a YouTube member and get awesome perks like access to our Discord server where I discuss space topics with the community every day. Do you know about the Y warehouse? Shop for your next Starship shirt or grab our famous Raptor blueprint shirt and countless other shirts made by space nerds for other space nerds. Links can be found in the description. You rock! And for the first time we got a real good look at how the Starship flaps move. And maybe even more importantly how quickly they can move. This is real-time footage from Lab Padre's stream. It's a test of the flap motors in preparation for the upcoming flight and it shows that even though this is the very first flight hardware, the flaps can move slowly and very rapidly in a controlled manner. And that makes me happy. The Starship aerodynamic fins or flaps as Elon Musk calls them are a new concept that's never been used before. Their only purpose is to control the Starship's descent while free falling through the sky. It's an ingenious idea that if it works will enable the Starship to change orientation on all three axes with a very minimalistic and easy to build system. It's one of many ideas that makes SpaceX's Starship a unique rocket. Seeing this boosts my personal confidence for the flight quite a bit. Let's keep in mind though that this is the first real flight ever. We might be in for a huge explosion and debris rain. Honestly though, even that would be a good thing. One essential element down, three to go. Next up we have the low cost propellant, orbital refilling and propellant production at the destination. All these elements can essentially be made possible by picking the right propellant in the first place. There are essentially three main fuel types in use by most rockets today. Kerosene or RP-1 which is a highly refined variant, hydrogen and then there is methane which SpaceX picked for their Starship design. All three types of fuel have advantages and disadvantages. In Starship's case we need a fuel that's cheap, that can safely be transferred in orbit and that can be produced on Mars. Let's look at kerosene first. Since it has a high energy density the rocket can be small. Its cost is right in the middle of all three. Propellant transfer can be done in orbit as it does not need to be cooled down that much. Actually it needs to be kept warm. And its atoms are rather large which makes building connections easy as the substance can't leak through as easily. But now comes the big downside. Producing kerosene on Mars would be rather hard as there is no oil there. So it's basically out for this very reason. Starships will need to be refueled on Mars for a return trip. Two to go. Next up we have hydrogen. Since it has a low energy density the vehicle has to be large. It's expensive to produce it compared to the other two. It could be made on Mars but maybe its biggest downfall is cooling. Hydrogen needs to be kept very cold as it has a rather low boiling point. At one atmosphere of pressure it starts to turn into gas at minus 252.8 degrees Celsius. While this is achievable in a tank it poses big challenges on fuel transfer as here even connectors would need to be kept below this temperature. Secondly hydrogen is the lightest and smallest atom in the periodic table. This means that it basically sifts through solid metal because the atoms can pass through between those of the metal. This makes it incredibly difficult to create a tank that keeps the hydrogen inside. While the fuel transfer is going on the hydrogen would exploit every smallest chance to get free and you do not want propellant to leak out while doing such a dangerous maneuver. This poses a lot of engineering challenges and makes hydrogen a rather bad choice for starships. And last but not least we have methane, the fuel that SpaceX chose for its starships. But why? It has a high energy density making the vehicle small. It's very cheap to buy or produce on Earth. It can be produced on Mars in large quantities utilizing the Sabatier process. It's a reaction between hydrogen and carbon dioxide at elevated temperatures of between 300 and 400 degrees Celsius and at pressures of around 30 bar which in the end creates methane and water. Both of which will be essential to have on Mars. And last but not least it is a large atom and it has a much higher boiling point at only minus 160.5 degrees Celsius which makes transferring it from one starship to the other much easier. By the way regarding the Sabatier process Musk gave an update too. The current plan is to start on the design of the fuel plant needed on Mars in about a year depending on how the starship development progress goes. Regarding orbital refueling there is not much known yet besides the 2019 presentation. It poses a few engineering challenges but the concept so far looks sound. 
SpaceX wants to dock the two Starships together and using control thrusters settle the propellant in the tanks. Then either by using microgravity or by using pumps the propellant is transferred over from the tanker Starship to the Mars Starship. Musk actually stated at the Starship presentation in 2019 that it would be technically more challenging to dock a Crew Dragon with the ISS than to dock two Starships together. Once the Starships are docked, the fuel transfer can begin. This has to be done five times to give the empty Starship enough fuel to fly to Mars and land. And SpaceX is working together with NASA's Glenn and Marshall Space Centers to develop and demonstrate a 10 metric tons fuel transfer of cryogenic propellant, specifically liquid oxygen, between tanks of a Starship vehicle. So NASA is very interested and gave $53.2 million of support for the development under this year's tipping point selections. In total, six flights are needed for one trip to Mars. Thanks to the fully and rapidly reusable Starship and the cheap propellant, this poses no problem. One essential element makes the other ones possible. And on Monday to Wednesday, SpaceX will hopefully and finally light the candle and go for the first of many Starship launches to come. Big thanks go out to RGV Aerial Photography, Nick Henning, Eric X Space, Casper Stanley and Mary from NASA Spaceflight for making all this possible. If you like complex questions and answers, you should try out some popcorn, your favorite beverage and today's sponsor. Curiosity Stream is smart TV for your smart TV. If you're watching my channel regularly, chances are very high that you're into science. Curiosity Stream has thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on topics like history, nature, science, food, technology, travel and more. They are specialized in what we love most. Featuring 35 collections of curated programs hand-picked by experts and streaming to any device for viewing anytime, anywhere. Whether you want to explore Mars or travel back to ancient civilizations, Curiosity Stream adds new binge-worthy films and series each week, empowering you to dive deep into your favorite subjects and explore new territory, sure to entertain, enlighten and inspire. Featuring award-winning exclusive and originals, Curiosity Stream is one of the largest libraries of high-quality documentaries out there. To binge watch the finest documentaries and at the same time support What About It, head on over to Curiosity Stream through my link or use the code What About It and sign up for just $14.99 for a whole year. Satisfy your thirst for knowledge with Curiosity Stream. Links in the description. Today's Patreon and YouTube member shoutout goes to Timo Schulz, Jason, Nikki Tiernagan, and many others. Thank you for all your support to the Y team. You make all of this possible. If you're not a patron or a YouTube member yet, consider supporting the channel. Awesome perks like our thriving Discord server, ad-free previews of episodes and your chance to talk to the team and me included. Last but certainly not least, I want to take the time to thank the team that makes the channel go above and beyond with every release. Each and every one of them helps in a way that could not be replaced. Most people can barely imagine how many steps are needed to create a single What About It episode. Without the team, a lot of these steps would just be missing. Thank you so much, you rock! Hydrogen needs to be kept very low. You need to be low. <laughs> SpaceX will hopefully and finally like the like lick the candle. The record was set by Shuttle Atlantis. Atlantis. <laughs> and adjusted for not injusted. Make sure to follow me. Follow me. Make sure to follow me. Make sure to follow me. Follow, <laughs> follow me. Make sure to follow him. Fo make sure to follow me. <laughs> follow me there. Make sure to follow me. God damn it! No. Make sure to follow him. <laughs> the fuck.